This is uh, Volker. I'm Jesper. And uh, one of the cool things about doing this is that we don't need these uh, magic things. So you can see my nice tie instead. So, uh oh. I'm locked in. Oh my god. I told you oh before. Well. Take off this I'm Jesper. stuff first. OK, we will be talking about advanced queue topics today, which means. Can you open? Ah. Fabulous. What is advanced topics? That's a, a good question. I'm sure that every single one of you has a, a very nifty, troublesome problem that you hope that we'll be covering today. I'm not sure if we will that, but uh, we'll give it a try. First of all, I'd like just to, to get a, a small understanding of who you guys are. Uh, I had prepared a joke that I would run out with a microphone, but Kevin already used that joke, so just by hand here instead. Can I see those of you who have never programmed a single line of Qt? Hands up. OK, awesome. How many of you have programmed less than one year of, of Qt? OK, less than two years. More than one, less than two. OK, fair enough. How many of you have been programming Qt for more than 13 years? <laughs> awesome. I have a friend <laughs> down there. Good. We have uh, three topics today to cover. We'll start out with uh, Qt Graphics View. Then we'll do multi-threading. And at the end of that, we'll do, um, what's that thing again? Uh, model view. Model view. There we are. These uh, three topics says up here a deep dive. And uh, that doesn't mean that we'll start from expert level and then go even deeper. Unfortunately, I'm sure that there's uh, lots of people that will find that interesting. But uh, we'll actually start from scratch on each of the topics and then go into some depth on these. These are all three somewhat advanced topics. Uh, in Qt. And uh, we have uh, uh, 90 minutes or so for the Qt graphics view, another 90 minutes for multi threading. And then we have two blocks, so two times 90 minutes for uh, model view. Model view. <laughs> Can I see the hands again? Just a bit of morning stretching here. See the hand? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> How about you all give yourself a hand here, too? Oh, man. Hard crowd. Can I see the hands of those people that uh, have been using Q Graphics View for, say, more than a year? OK, a bunch of experts there. We'll not be alone up here then. A yeah. uh, bunch of people. Let's see the hands of those that you multi threading for more than a year. Hands of those that used uh, Model View for more than a year. Awesome. The hands of those that have used all three for more than a year. What the hell are you doing in here? <laughs> Get out. Oh, well. Guess we can't throw people out. OK, so as I said, we'll start from somewhat scratch with these three technologies. We will not dive into an insane amount of, of details if, uh, if you hope for that. I'm sorry. Uh, we will, however, be available around here for the whole conference. Yep. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, drop by. We have a booth upstairs, uh, KDAP. And uh, we have a lot of technical people up there that, that knows their ways around Qt and will likely be able to answer your question. This uh, training here, Kevin already said, this is a part of a regular training we have, an introduction to Qt training, where these are three modules that we can do at the end. We have a bunch of uh, supplementary topics that we can do at the end. I guess that none of you will be needing an introduction training to Qt anymore. But if you have a coworker, send him our way. Hopefully, we will uh, convince you today that, uh, that we know something about something. I won't be doing much more advertising on that. Can you tell a bit about our services? Um, yeah, since most of you already are um, yeah, experts in, in Qt to some extent, um, maybe all you need is some, some extra manpower to make the next deadline. Um, that's something uh, we could provide. Or maybe you have a successful Windows application, and now with Mac becoming more and more popular, you might want to uh, offer it on that market as well. And yeah, this kind of migration is something we could also um, help with. Um, and he could continue on forever and ever, but we're not here to give you a lot of marketing. Bit, so what? that's it. I promise no more marketing. Come and visit us, visit us at our booth. 
Before we continue on, let's just introduce each other. This is uh, my good friend, Folger Krause. Correct right. pronounced? Fabulous. Uh, he's been with KDAP since 2007, and uh, that means that he's been professionally working with Qt for the last four years, so he should know a bit here and there. Uh, he's actually worked with Qt way before that, all the way back to 2002. He was uh, starting working in the KD project. How many of you know the KD? Awesome. Got a lot of friends in here. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so he's been working in the KDE project since 2002. Those of you who have been using KDE might have been using this mail reader called Kmail. He's the architect behind uh, Akonati, and uh, he's, the problem. he's your troublemaker in uh, if you're using Kubuntu, why your mail doesn't work. Oh. To, uh, to make up for that, he has created a new tool, though, called Gamma Ray. So make sure to go to uh, his presentation tomorrow on, uh, on uh, debugging techniques in Qt. Right? Yeah, something like that. And he will show Gamma Ray there. Come to our booth. It is really awesome technology. Yeah, and I'll be joined today by um, my colleague Jesper, Jesper Pedersen. Um, he comes from the middle of nowhere, somewhere in Denmark. Um, he is KDAP's oldest employee, um, oldest in the sense of longest time is the company, of course. Thank you, thank you. Um, and our chief trainer, um, he has more than 60 weeks or so done in, in training, so probably the most experienced Q trainer out there. Um, originally, he was a developer, but nowadays we only let him code in spreadsheets. Um, but he's yeah, still. So, any questions on Excel, just let me know. <laughs> um, yeah, but he still has his uh, pet project in, in KDE as well, K Photo Album, where he can actually try out all this stuff. And He's doing this cute stuff way longer than, than I am already. He wrote books about it already when, when I was still trying to figure out what a pointer is. Um, so Nowadays yeah. he's telling me what a pointer is. Let's get started, shall we? Yeah. OK, so we have, as I said, three topics today. The first topic here, graphics view. Folko will talk a bit more about what that is on a very abstract level up front. I'll just start out setting the scene here for what we're going to talk about. In our trainings, I usually tell people, we have three worlds these days, three parallel universes in Qt. We got the widget world. That is the good old thing with checkboxes and line edits and so on. Then we have in the other extreme, we have the, the Qt Quick world. That is where you'll have fancy, can I say iPhone around here, features. Uh, and then in between, we have this uh, abstract 2D graphics stuff called Qt Graphics View. That's what we'll talk about here. Cute Graphics View is kind of the glue between the two worlds. So if you want to do some Cute Quick, you might want to create your own elements, and those elements will be developed in Cute Graphics View. The next topic we'll talk about is multi-threading. Right. So why are we doing that? Um, who here develops software for a target platform with more than one CPU core? More than four? Eight, 265, <laughs> at least one. So <laughs> I'm really jealous on you. He has a good I budget, I'm sure. I want to, <laughs> to have that kind of hardware as well. Um, yeah, and that's, of course, why we need multi-threading, to make use of all the additional power we find in, in modern uh, CPUs, not just on the desktop, but increasingly also on embedded devices and, and mobile phones. And yeah, we'll be not so much looking at multi-threading in general, but on how to use multi-threading in, in Qt, so what um, technologies Qt offers us and how you use the, the Qt mechanisms of signals and slots and something like that in a context of, uh, of multi-threading. Right, and then we have a third topic. Third topic is model view. How many of you? I, I promise that this is a, the last part of exercise for you guys, and you can go to sleep. How many of you have read the design pattern book by the Gang of Four? How many of you understood it? <laughs> ah. Yeah, yeah, I, I have it at home. How many of you got, it, got injured by trying to read it in, in bed? Right? Yeah, I've been there, I tried that. I remember when I was reading that book, that was a long time ago, and there was this cool thing called Model View Controller. And I was just yeah, it's cool, but I mean, my checkbox already have the values stored in it. Why would I put that into a model? I just, just didn't get it. 
And then fortunately, many years later, Qt4 came around. And in Qt4, we now have this model view framework. And the cool thing about the model view framework in Qt is that you already have the views. So in that sense, the model view framework in Qt is just a separation of business logic, just as God intended it to be. Muhammad, whoever. No, sorry. So just as it was intended to be, separate the business logic into some classes. And that's what we'll be talking much more about when we talk about the model view. We will uh, do a bit of live coding there. We'll even implement a model that can uh, show you trees, which is a, a non-trivial piece of, of thing. Right. Yeah. First topic, graphics, graphics view. view. That's what we be, will be doing until um, lunch, lunch, approximately. Mm. Um, we'll be looking at uh, three areas in regarding graphics view. Um, we'll look at how the, the entire architecture fits together, the, the big picture on how things work. We will see that graphics view also has a, a model view separation built in. Um, We'll look into um, coordinate systems and, and transformations. So that's how you actually get stuff at the, the right position on the screen. And finally, we'll see how you uh, create your custom items. So with the built-in stuff, you only get rectangles and circles and primitive stuff. But if you want to see well, real useful elements on the screen, um, that's what we are going to see there. Um, so let's take an example. Um, say you want to write a, a game. Um, the custom item part will show you how you well, get the monsters and elements in your game in a way that they look how you want them. And the coordinate system transformation part will explain you how you actually get them to the right position on the screen. Um, yeah, that's what we'll be looking at in the... The uh, objectives, what you'll be learning at the end of this, you'll be learning how to uh, do Q graphics view related classes. Check coordinate scheme, all of the stuff that he's saying, really. So what will you not be learning? That will be, uh, be the more interesting thing, just so you have an idea of what Q graphics view can do that we're not going to show here. That's going to be a lot of uh, nice animation stuff in your Q graphics view, perhaps. So. Uh, Animation, that's already on the edge of, shouldn't we do this in Qt Quick? But you might have a reason to implement your stuff with Qt Graphics View and have animations in there. There's nice classes for doing that. Um, we also won't be seeing um, how to embed widgets, uh, how to do layouting in, in Graphics View. We won't see the, the fancy uh, graphics effects um, or all the, the details on, on performance tuning. Um. Yep. Here's a slide you've seen already. Just there. Small technical thing. You'll see these uh, overview slides from time to time. And when we see those, I will just very shortly tell you where have we been, where we're going. This is uh, just in case that you fell asleep during the presentation. Then you have a chance to wake up again and see where we're going. So as uh, Falko said, we'll start out looking at the architecture of QGraphics View. Then we'll look at the coordinate system and finally how we create our custom items. But as I said, we'll start out with the architecture. Right. Um, so, what are the, the basic elements we, we find in the Graphics View framework? Um, first of all, this is only for 2D visualization, as Jesper mentioned already. So, if you're into 3D stuff, um, that won't help you very much. Um, the central bit of the, the architecture is um, you have a model view separation. So, the, the world that you want to display is separated from the actual rendering on the screen, um, which allows for uh, nice things like having multiple views on uh, on the same world, different aspects of it maybe. Um, it allows you to model your world in um, yeah units that make sense in in your domain. So if you have some engineering drawing, you might want to work in in millimeters instead of pixels. Um, so much more abstraction from the actual rendering. You work in your um, domain units. Um, yeah, there's built-in animation support. We won't really cover that. Uh, the heart of the graphics uh, view framework, that's the, um, the fast indexing of the, 
the items you have in there uh, using a binary space partitioning, which is what Jesper will show us there. It's Can I get the camera over here? The camera man fell asleep. Yep, there we are. Yeah, it's basically a, a two-dimensional tree um, to yeah, index objects in, in a 2D space. Like so, so basically, imagine this is your scene. Now you are clicking on and you want to know which object did I click on. It doesn't really work out that well to run linearly through uh, 2 million objects to search for them. So it has basically the same thing as a binary search tree that you all have have learned so many times. But basically, the way that it works is that you'll just split it in, in four here and say, OK, which quadrant is, is it in, the, the click. OK, so I'll traverse down my tree until I'm so far down that I found which, uh, which list of objects that it can be in. And then it'll just look at those few objects instead. Right. And that, of course, allows you to work with models that contain a huge amount of, of items. Um, which in, in any real-world visualization application you will have. And that's the kind of complex internals you don't want to write yourself. So that's really the use cases where you want to use um, graphics view and let that take care of all these um, this hard internal bits for you. Um, and of course, there's support for, for navigation in, in scenes, for zooming, um, printing, and yeah, obviously rendering. Um, yeah, I think that's the, um, the overview on the architecture. That's a few different use cases that you can, you can, can, can use QGraphics View on. Just to give you an idea, if you're still sitting there still saying, gee, how is, how is this QGraphics View going to save me anything? Uh, I'll just uh, challenge Folger here just for the fun of it. So Folger, that fancy looking down, go, go, get it up. The thingy up there with the, uh, ah. Here we are. That thing here. Oh, the, the dial widgets? Yeah. I could have done that in a, in a Q widget myself. I would have implemented the paint event and done a bit of painting. Why? How is that going to sure. be much faster yeah. in doing Q graphics view? Well, the painting might be similar, but now imagine you want to have an, a nicely animated, um, what's that um, thing called in the um. dial? Arm. Um, yep. Now imagine you want that nicely animated. Um, imagine you want to, to have it interactive, so if you click on it and drag it around, um, you want to figure that out. Doing the mask for that yourself in, in normal widget code is, um, is quite hard. Uh, and Graphics View gives you all of that for free already. So even for relatively simple scenes like just a single widget, it might make sense to, to use Graphics View already. So basically what Folger is saying, in had this been regular widget world, I would have subclass Q widget, for example. I would have implemented paint event. I'll look at my data structure, and I'll draw the circle. I'll draw the arm at a given angle, and so on. And I would have overridden the mouse press event, for example. And when I click somewhere, I would do the math to figure out what logically is on that position. Right. But with Q graphics view, you'll instead create a number of objects. So you'll create the arm being a object in Q graphics view. You will override its mouse press event whatever that's called. Yeah, and we'll get to that. Then you will act on, on that particular one there. OK. Let's uh, see Hello World in a uh, graphics view. I'll give you uh, 10 minutes to decipher the code up there. And by the way, we, we forgot to say, but a spontaneous applause is when you see something utterly cool is uh, perfectly OK. So I guess not. <laughs> it is not utterly cool, is it? Um. Well, it's a text in a rectangle, black and white, on the screen. In a font that our Whoa. In a font that our designer would definitely say was ugly, but hey. Well, 30 years ago, it might have been impressive. <laughs> OK, so let's go through that code and see the, the various bits of um, graphics view classes in action there. Um, yeah, the first few lines, you all uh, know that, right? Include Qt GUI, um, main function, create and queue application. Um, after that, can actually point to that here. Um, that's where it gets interesting. Um, first of all, we need a, a widget that actually um, yeah, renders something onto the screen. 
that's what the class Q graphics view uh, provides us. That's just a widget as we know it, which we can which can render um, a graphic scene, which is what we create in the next line. Um, the graphic scene is the model, so it, that is what describes the world you want to to show. Um, of course, we have to set that onto the view, which will cause the view to render that scene onto the screen. Um, but so far, we have an, an empty scene, um, so we wouldn't see anything at all. So we have to populate that with some, some content. Um, and yeah, in our case, that's um, a simple rectangle. Um, for that, we create a Q graphics rec um, a Q graphics rect item, which well represents a rectangle in our scene, um, and we add that to the scene. And finally, we also add a text item. We'll see two different kinds of API here: uh, create the item first and then add it to the scene, or use convenience API on the scene. Um, to create the item directly. I have two things to add here. Well, one thing to add and a question. The thing to add is tonight at the party, those 93% of going to the party, try that out, Q graphics, wrecked item, say that 10 times in a row after the four beers you had. And the other thing, for, and he didn't even have four beers already, uh, right? Um, the, other, the other thing was, I don't see the, the relationship between the, the rectangle and the, the text. Where is the parent pointer given so that the text shows up inside the rectangle? Right, good question. Um, we don't specify any position for the text or any relation to any other item for the text. Um, so it defaults to being rendered at 0, 0, the um, center. For the rectangle, however, we specify um, a start coordinate and a, and a size. And yeah, minus 10, minus 10, that's up here. So if we render the, the text at 0, 0, it well, happens to be in the rectangle. It doesn't make any sense. You're going minus 10, minus 10 that off screen. How can you do that? That's well, um, as we mentioned earlier, the scene is not in pixel, but in logical domain coordinates. So that could be whatever I want it to be. Um, in a negative world, I guess. Fair even enough. that could be negative, and then, of course, it's mapped to something that you can really see on the screen. So um, the 0, 0 in the widget maps to minus 20, minus 20, or something like that in the scene. Yep. Um, we will see that in more detail when we look at transformations on how you actually can do this uh, mapping. Here is a, a URML diagram just giving you a, a, an idea of the players in this field. We have uh, three players. We have the Q, Q graphics scene he's already talked about. Then the URML diagram here indicates, and uh, that's because I can read URML diagrams, <coughs> indicates that uh, we, have an, we can have multiple Q graphics view looking at the same scene. So if it made sense, and there are multiple use cases where that makes sense, you can have the same scene looked at through different views. They can be transformed differently. They can be, one can be zoomed in while the other is showing a more broader map or something similar to that. On the scene, we have a number. We have seen two so far, but we can have way more. We can have millions of Q graphics item, or rather subclasses of Q graphics items, obviously. Uh, and that's what this, uh, this UML diagram will show you. We'll now here in the next five minutes go through the Q graphics scene, the Q graphics view, and the Q graphics items to see what, what are the key, uh, key features of each of those. Right. Um, yeah, the core of this entire uh, system is the Q graphics scene. Um, the model, if you want, that describes what you actually want to display. Um, this is the, the class that contains the, um, the binary space, space partitioning index. Um, that's where you add all your items to. Um, it's also responsible for uh, event handling and event propagation to the items. So if you want to have interaction in your, uh, in your graphics view, um, the scene takes care of propagating mouse clicks or keyboard events to the, to the right items. 
Um, and it's also the thing that manages the, the actual rendering. So it decides which item is displayed on top of another one um, or behind another one um, based on the, the Z order of the, of the items. And here is uh, some important methods of queue graphic scenes. I guess the unimportant method are just going to be deprecated in the next version of Qt or something. We have already seen the add item. That is how we get our items onto the scene. And in this code piece that you see down there, you can see that I create an ellipse and I, I say add item on the ellipse, don't I? I don't. Whatever. I would, of course, need to say add item on the ellipse. There are some utility functions or convenience functions in the scene itself. So we have the add text in the scene, so I don't need to create a queue graphics text item and then say add item to that. But the real use case, the thing that you, when you leave this room and you go back and start working with queue graphics view, you will not be creating uh, ellipses and text. You will be creating something more complex, your monsters in your uh, Wolfenstein uh, copy game or whatever. And those, of course, do not have these uh, convenience methods in, in uh, the queue graphics scene. The queue graphic scenes also have methods for asking for all its items. That is uh, usually not a good idea, because uh, there might easily be millions or hundreds of thousands of items in your scene. Uh, you can ask which of those that are selected, though. So if you have some way of selecting your items, you can ask for which are selected. And there is a, there's a few more methods in there. Right. Um, then another very important element in this, of course, is um, queue graphics view, the widget that actually renders something on the screen. Um, while you usually only have one scene, uh, you can have multiple views that display, well, s different areas or the same area um, of a given scene. Um, graphics view, the uh, queue graphics view also uh, provides you with support for, well, at least very basic support for, for navigating. In a, um, in a scene like uh, scrolling around to, to see different areas. Um, it can do zooming and rotations. Um, unfortunately, not built in as built in action so that you can actually use that out of the box, but you have to uh, implement a basic event handling or something like that for, for it to work. But it contains all the, uh, the transformation bits you need to actually zoom in or rotate um, to show different aspects of a scene. Um, it also takes care of mapping user input on the, well, from, from screen coordinates into something you can work with in the scene. Um, so mouse click on a specific point in the Hello World example will be automatically translated into the logical coordinates we work with um, in our scene. Um, and it has another very um, powerful feature um, and that's called level of detail. And the easiest way to explain that is to show this nice little demo application that comes with Qt. Um, so that shows us four different graphics views on the same scene. The scene contains, I think, 40,000 of those um, little chips here. And if I zoom in, you will see it has a lot of detail on it, a text and um, some, some little symbols and the pins on the side and even some shadow effect. And if I zoom out further, you will notice that now the, the pins are gone and uh, now the symbols are gone. And I can even zoom out further. And you see that I can have uh, totally independent transformations uh, of all those views. And we will also see that they actually show the same scene. So if I select a few things here and move them around, you will see that it's automatically updating all views. Um, and it's translating the, the interaction correctly. So even in the rotated uh, bit, it will move the stuff correctly around. And that's all built into, into graphics view. Can you zoom out a bit more on the one down there? Zooming out? Yeah, zoom I all the way out. 
it's at the end already. Oh, then resize so we can see the whole picture. How many of you recognize this picture? No, not from the demo, from a video. <laughs> Obviously not many. Here is a fun thing to try when you get back home. This video is from just the day when Qt4 was released. Uh, that was the first time that uh, Trolltech, as they were called back then, they decided to put out binary versions of the software. So you don't just download the source code, you could download the binary. Lots of people would, of course, download those gigantic packages that was like 50 megabytes big. This is back six years or whatever. And at the same day, the, uh, the, the amazing, powerful brains at Trolltech decided, we will put out a video too. So this is, uh, oh, oh, uh, this is from uh, the Qt4 dance video, four minute long, where the trolls are singing and dancing. Very embarrassing. So anything that we'll do today, nothing. Go and watch that video, and <laughs> we'll be excused for our appearance up here. Of course, that was like 100 megabytes large. So everybody trying to download that at the same time, we got like uh, it took two days to download the new Qt version. So. System administrator I actually quit two weeks later. I don't know if there's any relationship there. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, so that's uh, level of detail allows you to um, well show a great amount of detail if you're zoomed in, but optimize for speed if, as far as you zoom out and details wouldn't be visible anymore at all. And that's built into a uh, graphics view for you. So. Um, especially if you have very large scenes that will uh, become very handy. And finally, uh, Graphics View also has support for hardware accelerated rendering using, using OpenGL, so to even get more performance out of this. Here is uh, some of those important methods again. We'll see some code soonish, so you'll see all these important methods in action. There's the set scene, that's how you make a relationship between the view and the scene. Obviously, we already seen that. There is set rendering hints, set render hints. Uh, which we'll not talk about, but this is going to be the most important part of your work for, uh, for quite some, some time when you start using Qt Graphics View. That is where you can, uh, there, is a, there is a huge amount of trade off that you need to do in Qt. Should we do this really fast or should we do that fast? If I can get the camera over here again, just an example. One of the things that you can specify is how deep we should go down here. And uh, obviously, if I make, uh, if I continue. Dividing here, then it will be uh, the, the, the amount of things that I linearly have to go through to find if a given item is there is going to be smaller. But on the other hand, if I have a whale, for whatever reason, I'll show my drawing skills here, just in case you can't see. That's why I told you it's a whale. The whale here will be uh, will be be filling up so many many buckets. So it could fill up like all your memory just for telling. Yeah. On that, that uh, this one here, we have the whale. Well, further down, further down, further down, a whale there, and a whale there, and whale, 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 all over the place. So that's a trade-off that you need to decide when you do your, when you, you when you look at your application. Uh, am I going to have millions and millions of items in here that are tiny? Then I should have my 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 tree be deep. If I have fewer that are that are covering a number of these that are larger, then my tree shouldn't be that deep. And these are the uh, set rendering hints is just a, an example. But there is a, there's much, many of these tricks that you can, uh, can specify. Yep. Some of them on Qt Graphics View, others on, on Qt Graphics Scenes. We'll see a bit about uh, coordinate systems, how we can go from one coordinate system to the other. And there is a map from scene, map to scene methods. So when I have my widget, I click somewhere on it. I need to know that pixel, what pixel, what value is that in my, in my scene? Remember, we started out seeing something going from minus 10, minus 10, though my monitor started up at 0, 0. So there's got to be a mapping there. And there is, uh, you already saw the scale, rotate, translate, and transform method. That's what uh, Volker did when he had those uh, chips and he started rotating them. Uh, that is a method on the view that you can can tell what part of the scene am I looking at. Right. But just to not scare everybody, uh -oh. um, the That's defaults what he's are usually pretty good. Um, hmm? 
No, the, the defaults are usually pretty good. You only need to touch that if, um, yeah, if you run into performance problems with really, uh, really large scenes, or you really have that veil and a lot of small item scenario. Uh, but in general, that just works fine for uh, normal sized scenes. Okay, and then the final piece in this um, UML diagram, um, graphics items. Obviously, that's the one you have the most instances of um, in, in your scene. Um, a graphics, uh, Q graphics item is the, the abstract base class for that, so you can actually instance or create an instance of that. But there's a, a large number of subclasses built in already um, for usually for all the, the primitives you also find in QPainter, rectangles, polygons, circles, this kind of stuff. Um, there are also a few um, more complex ones um, that, for example, can render an SVG file or just a subtree of an SVG file. Um, can be very useful for doing theming in, in these widgets we saw earlier. Um, or you can even embed normal widgets into a graphics scene. Um, items also can have their, their own transformations. Um, that's especially useful since, you, since items have a, a parent-child relationship similar as you might know it from, from widgets. So if you apply transformations on an item, those will propagate to its children. So if we um, take our monster from the, the game again, um, if I want to move that around, I only want to move well, the monster object as such around. I don't want to move all the individual monster body parts as well, but I want to group them together and just apply the transformation once. Um, yeah, there's some built-in support for um, interaction like drag and drop as well. Um, right, we have an example on Uh, simple graphics view with some of the built-in items. What more than a rectangle or a rounded rectangle would you ever need, right? Um, we will, of course, see how you create more complex custom items later on. That's amazing how you did that. You had a screenshot, and then you clicked, and then you got the exact same window up, just looking right. different. Impressive. Next slide. So we have uh, the graphics. Q graphics item, the super class, the public API of this one. Q graphics item has two faces. It has the faces that you'll be using when you use Q graphics item. So that's what you'll be using when you when you have a something as complex as a Q graphics rectangle or your monster. They will you'll be doing stuff with those from the outside. Of course, from the inside. That's the virtual methods that you'll be overriding to implement that stuff. We'll see the, the inside in a, in a few slides. Um, but from the outside, you can tell the rectangle where is it going to be with a set pose. Or you can ask where it is with a pose. You can, uh, you can uh, move it by just a few pixels, so you don't need to ask for the pose and then do your offset in there. You can s do specify the set value. Here's just a small test. Might even give one of those. Uh, Hundreds of beer tickets I'll give. I'll get after the show. Might even give one of those away to whoever can tell me what is the stacking order of widgets. The stacking order of widgets. Yeah, you don't really know. Widgets are supposed to be standing next to each other. Well, I can tell you. Then I'll win my own beer tickets here. The stacking order of widgets is, how, is the order that they were added to the parent. And if you raise one of them, it will go to the front of the list. And uh, that's, uh, that's just uh, that's how it is. But with widgets, you do not want to, to know the stacking order. But with in Q graphics view, you do not have real 3D as you would in OpenGL. You just have items that might be standing on top of each other. So if you're drawing your monster, you might uh, draw his uh, skin. And then on top of that, you might draw the hairs and so on. And that the stacking order, of course, is important. Specify that with the set order. Important thing to know is that the set order is for the item. So if you have a set order that goes from 0 to 10, 10 being the front, 0 being the back, then you cannot like, make 
the hair of the monster jump in front of another monster that is standing behind the monster by just increasing his. It's going to be within the monster that the stacking order is there. We will not talk much, though I can tell you that there is some built-in features in Q Graphics View for moving things around. So in the, this, the fancy window that Falco brought up just before, he could actually grab, taking one of the, the items. Let me just show you here. Could do that. Where is my mouse? Can you bring up the? Yeah. Yep. So he can take one of these and drag them around. There is uh, no code in this example that is for that feature. That is something that comes completely for free with your Q graphics view. If you do not want that feature, you can disable it. You will be overriding your mouse press event kind of method yourself, and then you will not, uh, not call your superclass, and then this will not be working. OK. Closer than closer closer again. But if you want that, then you will be, then you will be uh, using some of these methods here. Set enabled, set focus, set selected. These are all built-in facilities in the Q graphic view. Q graph. Q graphics item. I should have had a beer before this. OK, we've talked about the architecture. We will, after this next section, talk about how you create your custom items. But in between, we'll be talking a bit about the uh, coordinate system that is used here. It's, uh, we already seen two coordinate systems. We've seen the widget coordinate system that started 0, 0 at the top of your screen. And then Folger had that uh, scene coordinate system that started at minus 10, minus 10. And there's actually much more uh, to say about coordinate right. systems. And there's actually also much more coordinate systems. Um, right, we have the outermost, the, the green one. That's the, uh, the screen coordinate system. That's what's actually in the graphics view on the screen. That is pixel-based, starting at 0, 0, and the, in the left upper corner, just like you know it from, from widgets. In there, we have somehow mapped the scene coordinate system. That's the blue one. Um, you can specify the transformation on how that scene coordinate system is actually um, put into the, the view coordinates uh, on the Q graphics view object. And then inside the scene, we have a number of items. And each item has its own coordinate system again. So um, the red one, that's of an item uh, positioned inside the scene directly. And then we have child items in there that are positioned relative to the coordinate system of um, its respective parent item. So in the end, for the um, yellow item there, we combine the transformation um, of its parent item, of the scene, and of the view um, to actually calculate where it's displayed on the screen. I have a nagging feeling you'd like to tell these people how that works. Right. And that's actually very, very easy. Um, that's just matrix multiplication of the uh, linear affine transformation matrix, uh, which you probably all remember from uh, linear algebra in school. So doing a simple rotation is um, as easy as cosinus alpha minus sinus alpha zero uh, sinus alpha cosinus alpha, 0, 1, 0, 0. And you just multiply that matrix uh, to the other transformations. And you have a rotation. Um, and yeah, scaling That's is it? even easier, yeah. Um, can I, just for the fun of it, can I see the hands of the who, those who understood that? See? Gee. <laughs> OK, well, let's skip the next few, just you. few slides then. <laughs> Gee. Just supposed to be one guy. <laughs> oh well, for the rest of us who is not, uh, who, whose university career is way, way, way too many years ago, and who was drinking lots of beers during uh, classes, I guess, uh, those of us we can get by with something slightly easier. The class that he was actually talking about, I'm not sure if we mentioned that. The class is a class called Q Transform. That is where you'll have your 3 times 3 matrix, which you can fill out, and you can specify each of those uh, nine parameters yourself. But for the rest of us, 
we have a uh, we have a few methods on that Q transform that will make our life so much easier. So instead of understanding cosinus and sinus and and other fancy stuff over there, uh, I will just say uh, transform dot rotate 40 and it's rotating 40 degrees. If I want to have my transformation being a scale, then transform dot scale two and I have zoomed in at a factor of of two. I can do shearing, uh, rotating, scaling, transform, and uh, all these methods are on the class Q transform. And once I've set up my Q transform, I can either on my graphics view or on individual items just simply call set transform, and then the the setup that I have specified there is is working. The rotate. That was the thing that I was missing here. The oh, rotate right, is. Um, hmm? I'll get the example. Okay, the rotate has a. We talked about. Don't rule it yet. Don't rule it. Don't press. The rotate has a. I've, I've told you that Q graphics view is for 2D graphics. Actually, I've been lying. At least if you hear what the Nokia people run around, they say it's for two and a half D. And like, okay, how does half D work? It's not true. 3D. It's not like you can can run around and zoom in and see whether Volker ironed his jacket on the back. Also, it's just the front. Uh, but it's a transformation. So this house here, click on it. Okay. You can see that is uh, rotating, and it's well, rotating. I wonder. Yeah. It is rotating, not just in the x y axis as you have like this usually, but it's rotating. Something that looks almost 3D-ish, and uh, that's uh, a parameter that you can specify to the rotate method. So uh, I challenge you to uh, tell me how you do uh, rotation around the, uh, the set axis with your math over there. Well, with, okay. uh, with my version of it, you just specify the QT colon colon whatever axis uh, as a second parameter. And uh, by the way, this is an example that I have created. Uh, you can see that from uh, it being uh, houses. That is uh, my extent of uh, capability in, in drawing. Folger obviously loves it. He's been standing there like, can we carry on? You uh, can play with it yeah, yeah. tonight. OK, OK. Is that? Yeah. I think we already said that. Yeah, can you right, just go? Right. OK, zooming. Fogger. Um, yeah, that's a piece of example code you might find uh, in, a, in a graphics view subclass to actually uh, implement zooming whenever you use. Uh, oh, we don't use the, the mouse wheel yet. That's the next example. But that's actually applying an, an extra zoom factor to the, um, the current transformation. And that contains one neat little trick you will see in, in many places in, in graphics view code. Um, that's extracting parts of the existing transformation um, you're interested in from this complex matrix form. Um, and the trick to do this is to transform an object of um, at a def defined position or a defined size, and then afterwards check that uh, property you're interested in. So in this case, uh, we transform a rectangle of size one by one, and afterwards check how big it is. And that gives us um, the scaling part of the transformation, because the transformation could do rotation and translation and all kinds of other stuff. But if we only want to know um, how much we did scale it, um, that's how we can um, yeah, calculate that again. Um, very useful in, in many places when you deal with transformations in graphics view. We just skipped uh, two slides here, I realized. So let me just uh, go back oh. two slides. Uh, this is still on the transformation that I was talking about. So we have here is the code for rotating the house around the, the center axis there. Create an instance of that Q transform. We call rotate 45 degrees around the set axis. Then we can scale it. Uh, that is 50% uh, both on, on the x and the y axis. And at the end, on our view, this could have been on a, an individual object. This example is just on the view. I said set transform t. The uh, the view has a uh, a parameter that's very interesting, and at least 
good to know that you have. Uh, it's called set transformation anchor, specifying where is your zero comma zero during those uh, rotation. Those of you who remember focus math over there will know that uh, there's when you rotate something, there's you m you could think of mapping from one coordinate to another, and there's one coordinate that's going to be the same, and that is zero comma zero. So uh, if I was if I had a view here, and this was my screen, and I wanted to rotate this uh, 90 degrees, if I didn't do anything, just rotate it, I would get something like this coming up here. And all of a sudden, I wouldn't see anything because it was rotated off screen. What I likely wanted to do instead was to rotate around the center of my scene. And there we, we have it like this. And that's what you specify with this uh, set transformation anchor, where you can specify the default is that nothing, so we'll just rotate off the screen. You can anchor view center, so cent rotate around the center of your view, or anchor on the mouse which is useful if you, for example, do wheel zooming. So you have a scene, and you place your mouse some, somewhere, and you scroll, and then you'll do the code that, that Falco just showed you for zooming. Um, and there, of course, you want to zoom around where the, the cursor is. These were a few methods on the, on the Q graphics view. We have similar methods on the Q graphics items. Uh, and again, we have the set transform origin point, so the same idea as before, except that this time it is not like center of your item. Here you explicit yourself, specify the x, y coordinate inside the item that you're going to transform around. So basically, it's a, like starting out with a translate to, to that point. Right. OK. Um, yeah, and of course, there's um, a number of methods on, on the scene in the view and on the items um, to translate between the different coordinate systems. Um, that's most often used for, for event handling. So if I get a mouse click on some position, I of course have to figure out what's that in. I get that in, in screen coordinates originally, so I have to map that to scene coordinates, and I have to figure out what item is there, and I have to map that to item coordinates to figure out on which child I clicked and so on. Um, so we have methods to map to and from all of these coordinate systems between two different items, from item to scene, scene to item, view to scene, uh, scene to view, whatever combination you actually need. Um, there's a whole bunch of them, and they usually can map points or even more complex geometric forms um, because they might be transformed differently. You again? Oh, yeah. Um, and then there's a number of use cases where you might want to ignore some transformations. Um, let's imagine um, yeah, a map viewer, and you have um, text labels on, on the cities. So if you zoom in, you don't want to make uh, those labels bigger and just overflow your screen, or you don't want to make them so small that you can't read them anymore. Um, so you don't want to scale them. Um, you probably also don't want to rotate them, because then if you rotate your map, you have all the labels the, the wrong way around, and um, you can't read anything anymore either. Um, you, however, want them to move around with the, the corresponding city. So you want to have the translation part enabled, but you don't want scaling or rotation. Um, and for that, Graphics View has a built-in flag that you can enable on um, QGraphics item to disable the rotation and the scaling bit of the transformations. So this is especially useful for, um, for text labels you have in, in your scene. Um, but it only allows this combination, so you can only disable scaling and uh, rotation and not translation. If you want to disable translation as well, that's a common use case for this um, kind of head-up display where you have um, fixed values in the, say, right upper part of your screen. Um, then you have to manually reverse um, the translation bit um, to have it in a, in a fixed position. You want to show this demo here? Yeah. Um, that's a nice little tool to actually play around with those transformations and debug them. So 
by default it runs in the Jesper mode where you can specify scaling and rotation and this kind of stuff. Um, in an easy to understand way and uh, there I can execute it and you see it scales, it rotates, it moves around a bit and it does uh, shearing and of course I can um, edit all of that uh, also use the matrix mode and say I want to do a 45 degree rotation and a um, scaling by a factor of two so I have to put in um, square root of two minus square root of two zero square root you of two. You prepared that at home. No, I can't do that from top of my head. <laughs> I had to fix the application to accept negative values. Uh, <laughs> and then I execute that and I have a 45 degree rotation and scaling by a factor of two. Um, so I can use that to debug my math. And you s can especially use it to Oops, what did I do? Um, to um, see how combination of uh, different transformations actually behave and how I might need to reorder them to actually do what I would expect. Okay, this is where it's getting challenging now. Oh, I guess I should go to the other screen and close that window, not close the, the screenshot that I had. <laughs> okay, so this is where it's getting challenging now. Had this been a regular class, you would already have been falling asleep. Okay, so it's a regular class. <laughs> um, and at this point, you would all be challenged with a small exercise. You would be implementing a pretty cool thumbnail viewer. It would have taken uh, an hour or so. I would have spent a bit of time giving you some hints on how to implement this thumbnail viewer. But uh, it's rather involving, so uh, instead I'd just like to, uh, to show you uh, the code for this uh, house instead. See if I can find a Q graphics view. There we are. So let me just show you the code for this. And I'll hope that I won't need a keyboard because this keyboard is encrypted in German. That's why I brought my own. And you don't see anything there. So let's no, no, no. keep it where it is. Okay. Window. Clone editor. But you need to open code first, of course. This one? I mean. Okay, so the code that you see here, and uh, I can see the mouse over here. Uh, this is uh, the the house, and let me just run it again so you can see what it. Just in case you forgot my awesome looking house. Compiling, running, mouse over. Come on, mouse there. So this is the house. You click on it, it rotates, and you can change the color of the of the roof and the color of, the, of the, uh, the front of the house here. And you can rotate it back again. And the code for this actually involves quite a few things that we haven't talked about. So just included it here in this uh, presentation just to give you a, a few hints on some of those uh, other things that, that are in QGraphics View. Let me show you the, the code for this. First of all, a good way of learning new code is by starting out in, uh-oh. Does it fit with your glasses on too? Yeah, it does. Sure. It's to start looking at uh, main.cpp, see what is, is going on in here. So I'm creating a Q graphics scene. Obviously, that's uh, needed for Q graphics view. I create a house here. Uh, so that's a custom item I've created myself. Uh, it has a green roof and a blue foundation. I uh, add the house. So remember, we talked about that usually you will not be, be having fancy add house on your Q graphics scene, but instead you'll create instances and then you'll simply do the add item on the scene. I create another house. My new house are moved to position 300 comma 300. I create a Q graphics view and I ask it to uh, render in initializing. Let's see what a house looks like. Okay. Not in this world. There we are. That's our house. It's using a class that you uh, didn't see in uh, the previous presentation. It's a Q graphics item group. So there's actually two different ways of creating your own custom items. One of them is what we'll be explaining after this uh, short house demo here, namely by subclassing Q graphics item, overriding paint event, overriding. Um, 
bounding rects and overriding whatever you want. And the other one is just by putting a number of pre-existing items together into one class, just like when you in the widget world are creating a dialog that has checkboxes and line editors and everything in it. So I'm using a QGraphics item group. Uh, and here's my constructor. I have mouse press event overridden so that I can act on on event. We'll see these events a bit later on. Uh, here's a number of slots for the rotation stuff, some private methods for for creating the actual house in a nice way, and a bunch of uh, of instance variables. Let's see what the code for the creating of the house look like. So my house is a, as I said, a Q graphics item group, and uh, I create first the roof, then the front, and then the back. I'll show you a small trick on how I get both, as I said, in, in QGraphics view, it's only 2.5D. So when I move to the back, I can see, if he will stay still, I can see the back of Folger. You cannot. But there is not a back of things in QGraphics view. So I had to fake that myself. So I'll show you how, to, how I did that uh, a bit down the line. A small trick here, set handle child events false. Otherwise, I would never have my my, when I try to bring down the combo box, the queue graphics, queue graphics item would steal the event and it wouldn't go to, to that, uh, that item. Here is uh, the crate roof. It's a queue graph. Looking at the wrong screen. <laughs> Sorry. Here is a crate roof. It is a queue graphics polygon item. That is a, an item with a number of points that are connected together. It is the roof polygon that we have just above. So that's a list of 0, 200, and 200, comma, that's not the roof, is it? 0. Oh, off screen. Lovely. OK, so on my screen, I see 0, 200, 100, 0, and 200, 200. So that is the, the triangle that makes out the roof. And now Fulco is going to break everything. Nope. Awesome. OK, so that's my roof. And then I call add to group. That is how I get that new Q graphics polygon item. And thanks God for code completion in Qt Create. I cannot remember those names. Q graphics polygon item is added to the Q graphics group by calling add item. Just like you would, would create children of your widgets in the widget world. I set the brush of the roof to be that color that I have. Create the front of the house, similar thing, Q graphics rect item. Wrong screen again. Q graphics rect item here, and I add that to my, my group here too. Finally, creating the back of the house. That is the, the, the one with the widgets in. Uh, I create a Q graphics proxy widget. Remember, very early on in this presentation, I said there are three worlds. There is the widget world, there's the queue graphics view world, and there's the, the queue quick world. And sometimes, as this example shows, I want to have something from both worlds. So I want the facilities of fancy rotating and all that stuff from queue graphics view, but I want the, the configuration from my um, uh, just regular widgets, the combo boxes with the colors in. I want that from the widget world. And I do that by simply creating an instance of a Q graphics, where are we again? Q graphics proxy widget over here. The Q graphics proxy widget has a method called set widget. There I tell it which widget it is that it, it needs to do. And create config widget, I'll not show you that. That is just a regular widget world C where I create a, a Q widget with a few labels and a few combo boxes uh, inside it. I tell it about the uh, the geometry so that uh, that the configuration page fills the same thing as the foundation of the house. I add that page to the group and I hide it. So the back of the house is not visible. They are both locating. See, set geometry on this one is the body rect. So it's standing exactly the same place as the the, the rectangle that we saw above that what had the, the the fancy color, but this one is hidden. Create config widget, see, Q widget, Q layout, Q label, Q combo box, regular, Q from the widget world. And I return my, my thing there.
create color combo box that are those combo boxes for the color in. Update roof color. That is a slot that uh, whenever, whenever I click on one of these, it will update the color. Simply roof pointer set brush. Update house color. Similar thing. And here, the interesting thing for the animation comes in. So when I click on a mouse, when I click on the house with my mouse, I will uh, get a mouse press event, just like for in, in the widget world, except there is a, a difference here. I get a Q graphics scene mouse event instead of just a Q mouse event. Uh, we will talk much more about that yep. a bit later. Um, and then I will I'll check if I have a the timeline instance instantiated. If not, I'll create an instance of a Q timeline. That is a, an object that will fire signals uh, for one second. And it will go from uh, mean to max. And they are not specified, are they? Doesn't seem so. So that will be from 0 to 1. I ask it that it, the timeline's curve should be an ease in out curve, which will make the house start rotating slightly, then go faster and faster and faster, and then slow down again. I might just, with a back to the audience, I should do that. I will ask my timeline to start. For the next second, it will fire signals. And these signals are connected in a slot further above that goes into a method here called rotate house. It takes a number from 0 to 1 in uh, this position parameter. Uh, and I will calculate the angle that I need to rotate. The angle will be 180 times. Uh, well, from 0 to 1, so it goes from 0 to 180. If I'm already at the front of the house, now I'm going towards the back of the house, then I'll add the angle. So we add another 180. So first I go 0 to 180, and then from oh, 180 to, to 360. And here comes the trick, the part that, uh, that uh, we've been talking about in this section here, the Q transform. So I create a Q transform. I will say, Translate to 100, 0, and this is simply a matter of if I was uh, rotating around 0, 0, which would be up here, my house would be rotating like this, which I don't want. I want it to rotate around the top of the house, so it goes like, like this instead. So I translate to uh, 100, 0, which is uh, the center of the house. I rotate around the y axis, the amount of degrees. I translate back so the house doesn't move, and then set transform with this transform on my object. And this are the four lines of magic that require us for making the house rotate. That's one final thing here needed. Remember, the configuration was hidden. Uh, so at the point where I'm rotating at this exact point, when you can't see any single pixel, that's when I realize, OK, so I made it to. Uh, I made it to either 90 degree or 270 degrees. And I will hide the, the front and show the back. And it will rotate nicely back in. And uh, was that guy telling or something? Hmm? 15, 15 minutes? minutes. Yeah. OK. So I will be rotating. And exactly at this point, I will be showing one and hiding the other, which, is, which gives you this uh, effect of, of uh, feeling 3D, though it's still only uh, uh, 2D. OK. Let me just see how much we have here. Right. Hang on so a second, Fokker. Hmm? Hang on a second. Let's, uh, this is a, a good time to break. We will uh, we'll go like 15, 20 minutes into the next session talking about, uh, about Q graphics view still before we'll continue on with uh, well, multi-threading, you guys are the same after lunch, too. So uh, let's, uh, let's stop our talking here and uh, see if there's uh, any questions before we Good all point. rush off for, for lunch. Yep. Some dude with a microphone running. Oh, he got his there own microphone. I'd like you to go to lunch already. Take care. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> Hi, my name is Daniel. Um, at the moment, I have... Um, uh, kind of a problem which I'm implementing also in uh, graphics view and it's basically graph and but a graph which takes a lot of data as also millions of points okay and I came to the problem that uh, millions of points take a lot of time to draw 
So I tried two different approaches, one which is one path with many points, and, and the other one was many lines. Um, mm -hmm. The lines were, is better, but it still takes a lot of time. And from the, what you said, and also from the documentation, I expected a lot of items to be, to be handled quickly. And yeah. that's the first problem. The second problem also is um, I would like the line to be highlighted, or I changed the thickness of the line when the mouse is over it. Mm -hmm. But the calculation of where the mouse is takes a lot of time as well, and it's very bulky. So I take it that it probably uses um, um, rect um, or something, but I'm not quite sure on what basis. So I don't know in which direction to go to make my graph user friendly. I mean, mm. it takes normal time to, to work. OK. <laughs> I think this is um, related to the, the binary space partitioning we, we saw earlier. And that's exactly the, the veil example. So if you draw one long line with a lot of points, it's just one one item, and then the, you break the, the space partitioning. So if you create a lot of smaller items, as you mentioned, it gets a lot better, because this gets more efficient. Um, but yeah, there's some, some methods to actually fine tune that, uh, increase the depth of the tree or decrease it. So that's something you could um, uh, probably tweak around a bit and see if that, uh, if that helps. And the, yeah, the highlighting, I think item interaction is something we'll be looking at in the, in the next section. But again, I think the, it also boils down to this tree. So if you have, again, something that, that, that makes each of these containers in here contain 1,000 items, then Qt is going to do something similar to linear searching yeah. through these. And each of those, it will ask. Uh, we'll see that there is a bounding rank method, and there is a, what's the other called? Shape. Shape method. And we'll see that after lunch. And if, uh, if, uh, they are, if the shape method is, uh, is, uh, is taking a long time, th and you do that for a thousand items when you move over, then it will indeed get you some, yep. some bad updates. Oh, yeah. And the, the other thing, um, if you have so many items um, that might help, is level of detail. So instead of rendering a line, you could just render a point if it's getting s too small to actually see something, or not render anything at all if it's too small to see something, only when you zoom in, you render the line. Um, so that's another area where you might want to look into for optimization. Yeah, well, for that point, it was one of my reasons why I chose Graphics View, because I thought, um, because the Graphics View is based on, on more on, on the logic, well, the scene is logical, yeah. that I thought it will do that for me. Apparently, it's not the case. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure about the built-in line item, if that actually falls back to a point, if it's getting too small. Um, well, there's a lot of built-in magic in, in, in graphics scene, but it's, as soon as you have so many items, you will hit um, the limits of what's built-in, and you might need to, to do a bit of tweaking yourself um, to optimize it for your specific use case. Um, graphics view, after all, is, is very generic, so you can do a lot of different things with it. And it's hard to optimize something like that for a very specific use cases. Uh, but it gives you the opportunity to um, override some of that behavior and optimize it for, for your scenario. Um, could you just give me a, um, a name, for example, for how, what to look for in the documentation for the uh, tree um, uh, depth and so on? Um, Folger is looking up. I don't remember it? It's, it's, it's in Q graphics. For now. It's in Q graphics scene. Right. It's uh, it's a method in the scene. Oh, there it is. Uh, BSP, BSP tree depth. depth. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, with the we have a bit of risk here, and, and no offense, but we have a bit of risk. This is turning into a consulting where people have really, really hardcore things. So uh, I like to, uh, people having those hardcore things, I'll, I'll gladly answer them, drop by our booth. Uh, but if you, I'd rather prefer if, if you have something that's a bit more in, in the order of the questions uh, to, to what you've seen up here, just for making sure that, uh, that everybody gets something out of the question. Yeah, over here. 
I wondered a bit why you're doing the transformation, the transformation part and animation part. Um, is it a special reason why you're not using the transformation uh, framework for this and the animation framework, which Qt has now? You mean in the, uh, in the house drawing thing? Yes. Yeah. No, I could have done that with the animation framework indeed. This was to highlight exactly how the transformation we're doing were, were being done in, uh, in Qt Graphics View. OK. And yeah, this example is Qt 4.001 yeah. or something. This was created uh, way before the animation framework. Animations, and you are entirely right, animations these days, if you can do it, Qt property animation is a much better better uh, yep. thing for, for these kind of animations. Yeah, but even they are internally based on Qt timeline, so. Yeah. Now you have Qt Quick also. When would you use Qt Graphics view over Qt, Qt Quick? So what, what is the advantage of Qt Graphics view over Qt Quick? Um, well, Qt Quick is based on top of Graphics view. So most of the stuff we see here is also relevant in Qt Quick when you, at least in Qt Quick 1, uh, when you create your custom QML items. So this can be nicely mixed together. Um, what, well, the strength of Qt Quick, I think, is the declarative language on top of it, which makes it very easy, especially for designers, to combine existing elements, to define animations, uh, and to tweak them. But if you really need uh, visualizations, maps, engineering stuff, something like that, with many, many items, um, you won't be able to do that with uh, Qt Quick. You will run out of uh, CPU and memory uh, way before that. Um, because in, in Qt Quick, every item you create is one Q object, and there's a lot of internal Q objects connected to that for, for each property and stuff like that. So it's much heavier than, than Graphics View. Um, you can create several 10,000 items of this um, without problems, like we saw in the chip demo. Um, in my talk tomorrow, I have an example that creates just 3,500 QML rectangle items, and that will uh, need uh, several hundred megabytes of RAM. So um, it can be combined, but this is for um, yeah bigger kinds of visualization with a lot more items. There is, there is another use case. Let me tell you uh, something I implemented in Excel recently. I mean, in, uh, <laughs> in Qt Quick recently. Um, this was a customer that. Uh, that had a, a user interface that perfectly matched the, the, the Qt Quick setup. So if you walk around the floor and ask people, when should I use Qt Quick? You will hear an answer, something like, if you have animations in there, if you have like a list view kind of thing that you can go like, and then it'll stop in an item. Those kind of use cases, Qt Quick, people will say. Now here comes the problem. These cu this customer, as a customer the, are the most, was a troublesome one. Hi, Steve. Um, so for the camera. So the, uh, the customer, he had expectation that his user interfaces on a crappy ARM processor that doesn't do fancy much CPU and doesn't have a dedicated graphical unit and everything, he wanted user interfaces. And with the risk, oh, I didn't even. He wanted, wanted a user interface looking exactly as smooth and lovely as this thing you see here. That is my iPhone. So we had, uh, we had a list in Qt Quick of a couple of thousand items. So a list view kind of widget in Qt Quick. And when we did like, he, we would hit a frame rate of 10, 10 uh, refreshes per second. And the customer said, not good enough. We pay you guys big dollars here. Go and make it fast. So we were trying tons and tons of things different kinds of optimizations. Our delegates were, were, were implemented in C++ instead of Qt Quick and everything. Whatever we did, sorry, we got up to like 15 frames per second. And that is when, uh, when uh, suddenly I was uh, glad that I remembered that I've been, in, uh, been doing this Qt Graphics view once. Because what we did, and see, you need to understand a bit here extra, just before lunch, uh, Qt Graphics, no, Qt Quick, the items in there. If you want a custom item in Qt Quick, 
it is a Q graphics item subclass, actually a subclass of that. But anyway, so what we did in this project was to take a good old Q list view. So the one you know from C++ or from, from uh, the widget Richards. world. Q list view. We took that in and put that in through a Q proxy widget, just like you saw that I had check boxes and, and combo, bo or combo boxes and labels in there. So in this fancy Qt Quick application that could go like whew, whew, to go from scenes to scenes and animation, transition effect, and all the things that Qt Quick is, is awesome for, we still needed the Q list view. And that was a regular good old way optimized C++ one that didn't have the problem that when you scrolled, that you would be creating new delegates, which called new on in the, the JavaScript uh, interpreter that got us to the C++ land and creating a new Q object subclass and everything while I was just trying to scroll, scroll stuff. So that was a, that's, that's a, a, a bit longer answer to the question. Why would I want to learn this ancient technology anyway? If you've got thousands or hundreds of thousands of items, definitely need to go here. But also, just as a stopgap, those places where Q Graphics View doesn't no, where Q Quick doesn't really cut it. One last question before, uh, before lunch. We don't want to be late, because then everybody else have eaten all the lunch. Anyone? That's one over here. <laughs> run, Ronnie, run. Run, Ronnie. Nobody watched MTV back in the 80s, obviously. Can you raise your hand again? Uh, hello. I wanted to know if... Uh, Graphics view is fast enough to display a uh, video and uh, perhaps with overlay on top of it. Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure if you ever tried video in there, but. So you want, a, uh, you want a custom Q graphics view item that is uh, getting feed from a video source and then you want to rotate that and put that somewhere else and stuff? Uh, I guess I would definitely give it a try. I mean, it's hard standing up here, especially because there's a video camera there saying, yeah, sure, you can do that. But uh, I, I would assume that, uh, that that would be doable. Uh, he's uh, looking up Fonon here. Um, so. Yeah, I don't see anything on the first side in Fonon. But yeah, I would, uh, I would try Fonon. Uh, the, the, the very easiest way would just take Fonon, the Fonon widget, whatever it's called, uh, put that in a proxy widget inside your Q graphics view to, to make it show up and see if that's, uh, that's working out. If not, then uh, you're back at, uh, at creating your own widgets uh, with, with, with this stuff. So again, it depends highly on your, do you have a fancy uh, desktop system with pretty powerful GPUs, or do you have an ARM with, without anything? So somewhat difficult. I don't know. Worst case, there's always the draw foreground in graphics view, which you can overwrite and then paint your own stuff on top of it. So if you want untransformed video overlays, um, that's another approach you could, to, uh, could use if the, the phone thing doesn't work out. OK, I am sorry that we cannot take more questions. Uh, 200 people is slightly more than, uh, than the 10 people that we usually have in class. Before you go off, let me just uh, a quick refresh here. We have been looking at QGraphics View this morning. We have seen the architecture, how you have the scene, the view, and items on the scene. We have uh, looked at this coordinate transformation system in QGraphics View, which is, uh, allows you some pretty powerful things. Remember the, uh, the house that was rotating in just uh, four lines of code. And after lunch, we will be talking slightly about uh, custom items in QGraphics View. So how do you get your own monsters or your own uh, whatever you want to paint yourself? How do you get that into your QGraphics View? And uh, that will be like 15 minutes into that session. And then we'll, we'll change topic and we'll talk about uh, multi-threading. So uh, right. enjoy your lunch. <laughs>